Hanging out with the locals, then and now. That's next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine. Marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. <laughs> We're at the Blooms and Butterflies exhibit at Franklin Park Conservatory, a good place to hang out for both butterflies and humans. This episode of Columbus Neighborhoods is all about hanging out why we gather and where we gather. For some butterflies, perching is part of the courtship ritual. The male hangs out on a branch waiting for a suitable mate to pass. Humans do something similar, and back in the day we did it at soda fountains. Here's the story of a beloved hangout spot in Beechwold that found a new home in Circleville. The candy shop started in 1840 by my great-grandfather, Gottlieb Frederick Willick from Germany. And uh, he ran it from 1840 to 1905. Mostly they made stick candy and they also used to make a lot of what they called spun ice cakes because a confectioner back then not only made candy but they also made some fancy baked goods. Not the, not the bread and the staples that a normal baker would do, that was a regular bake shop. And then he retired to quote write his memoirs and uh, turned it over to my grandfather. And then he ran it till 1930 when the depression sort of come in and hurt him real bad. They had some financial problems, so they pared down and he turned it over to my father in 1930, Fred Whittick, and he wholesaled stick candy and hard candies for five years to all the little grocery stores. My mother, she had a lady come down from German Village and out of the goodness of her heart, she gave her one day, she showed her how to enrobe chocolates or dipping. Years ago, we also had a salesman used to come around and they would drop off little recipes to manufacture a cream center, stuff like that. They took a lot of these recipes and reformulated some of them and made what we call today as our cream center. Eventually, I took it over. Through time, we've gotten bigger. I've added things, and this soda fountain, and I always wanted one, so now that I got the big store and big building, I got me a soda fountain. Bob Eagle from Columbus, uh, he called me one day because he knew I was building a new addition to my store. And so he called me one day, wanted to know if I was interested in a soda fountain. So I told him I was going to have one in here. And when, when he called, he told me, he says, come on up and you can look at it. So I went up and it was only about half a block north of him at uh, the pharmacy. And I went in and talked with the gentleman, Arden Engelbach, and he showed me the soda fountain and told me that he was going to quit in the business because his eyesight was getting bad and he needed to do something else. So I uh, looked the soda fountain over and then I, I gave him a tentative price of what I could afford. He called me about three days later 
and told me, says, if you want that soda fountain, just come on up and get it. Says, it's all yours. So I went up and my wife and I spent three days disassembling everything and uh, moved it to Circleville. I had uh, a plumber come in. He was very good. He measured everything off of all the soda fountain and then it's lined up everything the way it needed to be. Mr. Engelbach and his wife, they came down and they instructed all the girls here on how to make sodas the old fashioned way. And uh, we basically do everything just like he showed us. And he even gave us a book that came with the soda fountain that tells instruction of how to be a soda jerk and the different recipes to make this and make that. The biggest thing is we get grandparents that bring their kids in here. And I had a sign that said, children are allowed two spins on the stool. Because I get kids come in there and they sit down on a stool and they go round and round and round and grandma and grandpa will be hollering, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> One lady wrote me about 15 years ago and told me she was born and raised in Southern Columbus in a log cabin and she worked at a little candy shop. When she got married, when they moved to California, she didn't think she'd ever find a piece of candy as good as what the candy shop in Columbus made. But then next door neighbors of hers received some of our candy as a Christmas present and the lady had a piece of that and she had to sit down and write me a letter and tell me how after all these years she found candy as good as what she had back then. So, sort of tell you we're on the right on the right track of what we're supposed to be doing and so I you know I don't change anything because it won't be the same thing I don't make a whole lot of money on it it's it probably holds its own that's about it I stopped considering myself being an owner of a business anymore I'm more I think a, a curator of a piece of history of Circleville to me, that's more important than owning a business. We're often drawn to hang out at places that are special, like Franklin Park Conservatory, or we might gather because of an event. And in the fall, that's football in this town. Sometimes people with common interests hang out, and in this case, the setting is uncommonly beautiful. Let's visit Whetstone Park to see what I mean. It's not open enough. Robin Alonzo. There is a center, but it's not exactly in the center. The foliage is, is just humongous. I like that it's the natural sort of full-blown that doesn't look like it's been manufactured by taking half the petals out. What is happening is that the American Rose Society and the Columbus Rose Club is conducting a rose show where amateur rose growers from throughout Ohio and even Kentucky have brought their roses in to be judged in all sorts of various different categories. I mean, much more impressive foliage on this one. They, I know, I know. And a straighter stem. And now we've got two Daddy Franks. Now this is actually smaller than several of the miniatures that we judged. I don't like it. I like how the Robin Alonzo is standing straight up and the other ones are sort of bending over looking at us, which okay. isn't perfect. Okay, so then we want to keep that one. Yeah, we're yeah. keep that one. We're looking for excellence. We're looking for a rose that's very well grown and also well presented by the exhibitor. We're looking for, if it's a spray, we want the spray to look like a symmetrical spray without gaps in it. If it's an individual bloom, we want it to be sort of triangular if you look at it from the side. And if you look at it from down in the top, to have a spiral center. We're looking to find what we call the most perfect phase of possible beauty for each rose. I like this one best, but they're all nice. 
I like the first choice best though. This was an excellent rose show. It's, it's a great rose show because we've got roses from all the classifications. There's miniature roses, there's old garden roses, there's climbing roses, there's hybrid tea roses. Sometimes in the spring you only have one or more of the classes because of how the season is. If There could be the old roses are blooming but the hybrid teas aren't ready yet. This year everything is blooming. This show has been going on for many, many, many years. You can see the, the roster of winners there at the trophy table. There's people going back all the way to the 1930s who have won trophies at this show. Hey, Eric Feingold, Brent Davis. Hey, Brent, how are you? Good, Eric thanks for Feingold. having us. Yeah, of course. Uh, this is a museum, but you've got a house here, but this isn't any house, is it? That's right, Brent. Yeah, it's a, uh, what we have behind us here is a uh, Lustron house, which uh, from 1948 to 1950, the Lustron Corporation, which was based right here in Columbus, uh, produced uh, this type of house. It was a mass-produced, prefabricated house uh, made out of porcelain and enamel steel. Let's go take a look. Sure, sounds good. So porcelain and enamel steel had a number of advantages. Um, for one, um, it was really, really easy to clean and uh, didn't rust easily and, and the colors would last for a very, very long time. Um, and along with those functional advantages, it had some nice aesthetic value as well. Like this uh, z futuristic zigzag that you can find on the column here that reflect a uh, growing interest in atomic technology in the late 1940s. So this is kind of a trendy house to have at the time. Absolutely. You went home? Oh, this is very nice. Yeah, so uh, Lustron houses were marketed as the house that America has been waiting for. And um, they were really pushed as very modern and, and livable spaces. And as you can see here, um, you know, you have the built-in uh, bookshelf right here, which takes away the need to have furniture taking up floor space in this open floor plan. And actually one of the other neat things about uh, the Lustron that we've set up here in the museum is that we've furnished the house with various objects that may have been found in a typical Lustron home in the 50s and uh, ultimately it gives our guests a way to engage with history that they may not usually get in a museum. I love the 16 millimeter projector. We might need that there, yeah. <laughs> if there's a budget cut. This is great how you can actually come in and sit on the furniture and go through the furnishings. It's really part of the exhibit. That's the idea, to create an immersive experience for our guests right here in the museum. So. Let's go immerse ourselves in the kitchen. Sounds good. So the kitchen is pretty interesting in here, uh, mainly for this appliance right here, which is called the Thor Auto Magic. And uh, this was a product that was developed in the 1940s and it could be found in many uh, Lustron homes. And actually, if you take a look, you know, as this would suggest, it could wash clothes and it could wash dishes. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't do either very well, so. <laughs> great idea, get a gravy stain out of a shirt, but. Right, really, I think. Really before multitasking had caught on. So we've got this home in the museum, but there's still Lustron homes that people are using, right? There were about 2,500 total that were produced between 1948 and 1950, and of those, uh, there's just about anywhere from about 1,500 to 2,000 left. In Ohio, there's about 200 or so of the uh, original 300 that were made. Are there any in Columbus in the area? Of course, yeah, there's uh, many throughout Columbus, but if you're driving down the street and uh, see one, I'd say turn around, come back to the Ohio History Center and check out the one that we've got here. So, Well, perfect. It's a great example and uh, really fun to see what Lustron Homes were all about. Yeah, it's a great piece of American and Ohio architectural history, so we're very proud to have it. Thanks for showing us around. Absolutely, Brent. Thank you. In this episode, we've been looking at hanging out in Columbus. For many years, the YWCA provided a safe place for women to stay and find employment when they came to the big city. Few organizations have been around as long as the YWCA, and few can match its impact. Here's more about its history and a look at the renovation of its landmark building. YWCA USA was started in 1858. 
advocating for child labor laws to 40-hour work weeks. And then in 1886, YWC Columbus was started right here by five forward-looking women who realized that there was a need in our community for safe and affordable housing and community for young women who were coming to Columbus from the rural areas uh, to start a new life and to look for work. 1929, Mary J. Griswold made the largest personal donation ever seen in Columbus to the YWCA, which built this building, the Griswold Building. A fun fact actually was that in 1929, when the building was built, there was a bowling alley in one of the lower levels. We had sports and gym components, which was unheard at the time. Uh, we hosted USO dances in the ballroom, advocating for an advance in civil rights and women's rights. We had classes and workshops for women. Uh, for auto repair workshops to prepare women for uh, wor work during World War II. This building has seen a lot. Actually, the Ohio Equal Rights Amendment was ratified here on the third floor of the Griswold Building. Well, back in those days, uh, it was a lot of housing, certainly for young women. There was some nice little dorm-style looking rooms. Over the last 100 years, the needs for women certainly have changed, and we were responsive to that by actually in the 1980s uh, applying for a HUD grant for some of the most vulnerable population in our community, and we were the first organization to actually receive a HUD grant. And since then, we have been uh, housing women who are uh, battling with mental illness, chronic homelessness, uh, and maybe addiction as well. 70% of these women will have experienced domestic violence at some point in their life. So truly a vulnerable population. But with an amazing team, uh, we meet these women where they are. We stabilize them. We surround them with 24-7 supportive services and case management. Hello, welcome to my home. I worked in healthcare recruitment and credentialing. So I was doing um, um, executive recruitment and exec in physician uh, credentialing and um, quality assurance. Unfortunately, in my life, I had a couple um, situations which uh, ended up um, not being positive for me. I had a breast cancer. All the domestic violence and abuse resulted in PTSD. That was very difficult for me. To lose my child was something which really made my PTSD uh, uh, really bad and I lost my place. I wasn't able to work, lost my place to live and uh, ended up in a shelter and um, then uh, luckily was um, this program was available for uh, single women and I ended up here. To me, it was very difficult to even deal with the fact that I, someone who had been always self-sufficient and take care of myself, and all of a sudden I was not able to take care of myself, and um, I, it was very difficult for my personal uh, feelings. Well, I'm doing great. I really love my place. I'm decorated it so it feels home. And I can't wait for my son to come and visit me here because he loves the, everything about downtown. Couch is like most comfortable couch to sit on. So getting back to work is biggest issue for me um, because of the uh, I had not been working for two years and it um, kind of scares me. Would somebody hire me when I was not able to work for two years? I really, I really love healthcare and really would love to uh, work in some hospital or health system or physician group. So that's what I would like to do. Before the renovation, we were actually housing 69 uh, women that were part of this uh, program for chronically homeless women who were battling with mental illness. And we're very excited that we were able to bring additional units to this community. And now we will have 91 units that will take care of this vulnerable population. I am one of the lucky ones. We were able to turn our pool. Uh, while the pool was historic, 
we could fill it in and now turn it into a ballroom. And that's a great opportunity, certainly, for this organization to have special events and, and support the mission of this organization with additional rental income. It's been a joy just to kind of experience this building that with a mission of eliminating racism and empowering women, there's always work to do. We're really looking to grow all of our programs, whether they have to do with our um, leadership for young women or uh, older women, whether they have to do with our social and racial justice programs, or of course our housing needs. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, many, many more years uh, to celebrate the work uh, that the YWCA does. Fraternities and sororities are still going strong at many college campuses in Columbus. And not too long ago, many high school kids also found the Greek system was a great place to hang out. But this practice had its critics. Here's the rise and fall of high school fraternities and sororities. High school fraternities and sororities in the Tri-Village area were very central in those middle 20th century years in the social life of young people. These fraternities and sororities were actually developed at the high school level and they kind of modeled them around the ones that they had seen at Ohio State University. The Rooks were a unique organization and fraternity in the sense that we were one of two high schools in the United States that had their own fraternity house. It was a safe harbor for guys growing up, teenage guys. We had pool table, we had ping pong, we had a hangout. When you were invited to join, until you became an active, you were a skunk, which lasted for a semester. And uh, when you were a skunk, you had to wear a little tie that said skunk on it. And whenever uh, an active would see you on the street or something, he could say skunk, and you'd have to do a, a jumping motion. It's pretty much like any fraternity. Pledges are the lowest form of life. I remember washing cars in sub-zero weather just because they could make you do that. For the most part, things never got out of hand. And you know, we weren't allowed to have any women there unless there was a dance or chaperones. I was rushed to LAL and loved it. We planned all the main formals that the school had. As a 16-year-old, I was making arrangements for catering with the hotel. I was selecting the room. I was planning a banquet for 100 plus people. It taught us at a very young age to take responsibilities for planning social events. There was always a reason surrounding a sporting event to get together with the clubs that existed in the other communities. One of the fraternities would invite another fraternity to have a party, or the girls would get together and have a spread before they would yell across the field in competition with each other. Grandview was our biggest rival. That was very important, as you can imagine, <laughs> in Upper Arlington. Lockers are all decorated stuff to beat Grandview, and that was a big deal. They were the rival. I mean, they were Ohio State, Michigan. When we were playing them at home, we would make raids on Upper Arlington and put a big G in the middle of their field with salt. They would do the same thing with us when we were playing them. I knew which sorority I was going to pledge, and then some of the mothers got together and decided that sororities should not be allowed in Arlington, and I was devastated. I thought, oh, this is the end of the world. In 1908, there had been a law passed in Ohio against these kinds of organizations, feeling them to be a threat to the values and decency of our young people. But it wasn't until the 1960s that we actually saw that law implemented. Teenagers don't see the other side or the not so good side. They don't relate to the fact that this whole principle of sororities was isolating a few. I was disappointed because I thought they were very beneficial, but I have to recognize they were beneficial for those people who were members of them, and it was detrimental to those who weren't. The last three or four Rook classes were clandestine or underground. Uh, if we were caught being a member of the organization, we couldn't play on a sports team, we couldn't be a class officer. And I think as a result of that, we eventually had to disband. 
it's still a great alumni organization of guys that have gone through that. It was a great time of my life. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us this week. And thank you for being with us. And remember, you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. So what are you doing this weekend? You going to see Logan? You already saw it? Yeah. What are you going to do? You ever been to the Funny Bone? How lonely are you? You know, I leave, you have to stay. You know only one of us is getting paid for this, right? Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA keeps our community moving forward. Algren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. <laughs>